so excited to have Terry and Cindy with us, and I know Terry and Cindy. And so let's stand this morning, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Jesus, for this day that you have created for us, O oh God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We give you praise and honor and glory. It's all about you, Jesus. And as we hear in your presence, we just ask that you to just minister in our lives. You know what we're in need of today, and that is you, Jesus. And anything that we're carrying, Lord Jesus, I just pray that you will minister mightily, God, and that that load, that burden will be laid at your feet and we'll learn to let go and trust in you in all things, oh God. Because, Lord, you're more than able. And you come that we might have life and have it abundantly. And, Father, we're so thankful for that. Now, anoint our worship. It's for you, God, I pray that you will just bless our hearts today and in this service, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and ask these things. Amen and amen. 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 <laughs>
Now, there is another part of my life that Otis and Denise know about that most of you probably don't, and that is I also spent a lot of time working overseas. I ran a security company with a former Navy SEAL, and we would do security primarily for nonprofits. And what that would do would pay for missions trips where I would go over to remote areas and train uh, teachers and pastors. So I was on one of those trips once upon a time, and um, I had finished training teachers and pastors, and so um, I had to move up closer to the Kenyan border with Somalia. Now, for those of you who don't know, Somalia is one of the most dangerous places in the world, if not the most dangerous. And I was probably less than two miles from the border. And my job there was to evaluate the activities of uh, Boko Haram and other terrorist groups in the area. And so I was in this little remote village, um, they had one generator that provided electricity for three hours every day, from three to six. And after that, it was as dark as you can possibly imagine. And so I'm staying in this hut with the only, th only thing that was on the windows was uh, these bars that were real close together to keep the baboons from coming in the huts. And so uh, I had gone to my uh, bed, dropped my mosquito netting, which had holes in it, by the way. But um, I'm laying there. It's a cool 95 degrees. It's about Oh, I'd say probably about 11 o'clock at night. Now, I'm like Otis. I sweat looking at this light bulb thing. <laughs> and so I'm laying there sweating, trying to sleep and process what had happened that day and think about what I had to do the next day. And have you ever gotten that feeling that you're being watched? I had that feeling. And my back... I was laying on my side, and my back was to the window. And I thought, okay, somebody has followed me back to this village. And so I'm thinking, all right, what am I going to do? So I pretended like I was asleep. First, I turned over on my back. And I squinted, but I couldn't see anything. And then I turned over on my other side. And about that time, I saw these big eyes in the window of the hut. And then I heard this low rumble, and I knew what it was. It was a lion right outside my window. And I thought, great, I'm his evening snack. <laughs> And I'm sitting there trying to remember how strong these bars were. And I had just seen, not long before that, a kill in the bush. So I knew how strong these lines were. And I knew that if he came through that, if he could get through that window, there was nothing that was going to stop him. So I sweated even more. <laughs> and I was sitting there and I was, the craziest thought came to mind. If he roars, I didn't pack enough underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Because you can hear a roar of a lion from three or more miles away. And it's interesting because the people tell you if you're ever out in the bush and you hear the lion's roar, run to the roar. 
To which I would say, yeah, right. <laughs> but what they're trying to do is drive you away so that the ones that are sneaking up on you can catch you. So I laid in bed for two hours, just petrified, because I could hear him out there for just a super long. And finally he left. Well, I found out the next day this very same lion had, they were building this, this uh, barrier around the, around the village because the same lion week, just the week before had grabbed one of the workers. And if it hadn't been for a pack of baboons, he would have killed and eaten the, the worker. So this was a man eater. Which wasn't of any comfort at all since I had to stay there for another week and he knew where I was. <laughs> but I think of that often when I look at some of the things that are going on in our society today and I think, where are the Christians? Where are we? Why are we not standing up? It makes me remember that fear. And those bars were on the window. Uh, if he'd come around to the door, I don't think I was as, much as confident about the door. But he stayed there at the, at the window. And whenever I get afraid to stand up for something that God has called me to stand for, I remember that line. Now, I don't think if I was in that same situation again, I would necessarily sleep any better. But I think the Lord gave me that experience for a reason. You know, many Christians today are just as petrified as what the Lord is calling them to do as I was with that lion that night. And it wasn't like this was my first lion. As I told you, I had seen lion kill a zebra. And I had been out creeping around in the bush and I had seen other deadly animals because Africa's kind of like Australia. Everything will kill you. You're no longer at the top of the food chain. We need to remember that God has taught us how to handle this situation. Because I almost bet that the Lord wouldn't have laid this message on my heart this morning if it wasn't for the fact that some of you are afraid to answer the call he has on your life. I mean, we live in a time in which it's not very popular to be a Christian like it once was. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we see in the Old Testament, and unlike some celebrity pastors today, I see no need to unhitch our wagons from the Old Testament. That's right. <coughs> Jesus never apologized for the God of the Old Testament. All Jesus did was he overturned the dietary laws, even though, based on what we know about health right now, they were pretty good. And he overturned the laws of the sacrifice because of his sacrifice. Other than that, he did not overturn one word in the Old Testament. Sometimes we forget that when he comes back, he's coming back as a warrior. Yes, amen. He's coming back like that lion I was so afraid of. Too often we just think of him as that loving lamb. But there's a lot of lion in Jesus. And we're going to see that one day. But throughout the Old Testament... We see that Jesus, I mean, we see that God gave us people who could 
speak to the very situation we're living in today. Now, if you don't believe that, turn with me, first of all, to 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32, where it says, Of Issachar, which, by the way, was the smallest tribe of all of Israel, of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. 200 chiefs and all their kinsmen under their command. Now let me tell you about Issachar because I've been fascinated with them for easily 40 years. The men of Issachar studied the Torah, their Bible, like there was no tomorrow. They knew God's word in and out. And they didn't just study God's word. They looked at it in terms of what was going on in their day and time. And they taught the people how to apply it. And they looked at what God was going to do next. So here you have the smallest tribe of Israel that had the most learned people in God's word. And they were the ones that the others came to to say, I don't understand what's going on. And what's God going to do about it? You see... God does not care how big your church is on Sunday. What he cares about is how much influence you have on Monday. Amen. Are people coming to you and saying, I don't understand what's going on? Which is a perfect opportunity to say, well, I've read the book. I know exactly what's going to happen. Maybe you all do too. How often do we do this today? Are we men and women of this car? Do we understand the times and know what to do? Or are we just going blindly along, listening to the world, doing whatever secular teachers and newscasters tell us that we should do? R.T. Kendall wrote in his book, Fear, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which I'm sure was inspired by Clint Eastwood, maybe. He said, there are three types of fear. There is the fear of God, which is the good. There is the fear of man, which is the bad. And the fear of Satan, which is the ugly. Now, I want to talk first about the fear of God because it's something sorely missing in the church today. Now, I know Otis and Denise are well enough to know that it's taught in this church. But I can tell you, in most churches, it is not. There are two ways that you can understand the fear of God. Either it's taught or it's caught. When and really and truly in most of the biggest churches in America today is neither taught nor called. Uh, some of you remember our daughter Holly. Uh, she married a young man that I admitted and put in her classroom in first grade. They went all the way to Christian school together. Uh, his father and I, since we've known each other for so long, made a pact that we weren't going to give our blessing to their wedding until they both graduated from college. So it was great. They were on the three-year plan. <laughs> they both graduated the end of May and got married the first of June. <laughs> they moved to... Uh, to Dallas, he went to seminary, and she started working at a church with 40,000 members, six campuses. 
She coordinated all their volunteers. She had 900 volunteers to coordinate on a weekly basis. They brought him on shortly after as their middle school pastor while he was going to seminary, and he had almost 900 children in his middle school youth group. When we would go visit them, I like to just watch them move. Because I couldn't imagine that many middle schoolers moving in an orderly fashion. Because middle schoolers don't do anything more. They don't have any. And then he had to worry, they had to worry about, okay, well, we've got to have this group do this first because they can't be in with this group because of rival gangs. And I mean, there was a lot to consider. I don't think I ever heard the fear of God taught in that church. There were great messages. But I don't think I ever heard the fear of God taught. It's not a real popular sermon. Let's put it that way. Right now, if we were to go into the Bible and look at the day of Pentecost, you would see that there were 3,000 people who were immediately converted on the day of Pentecost. And every one of them had been taught the fear of God. They had been taught this their whole life because the Old Testament is full of the fear of God. We look at Acts 2, verse 43, it says, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, I was brought up learning the fear of God. Some of you may just refer to it as reverence. Uh, I have the pleasure of attending in all white church. I was the only white in my church. The pastor called me Spy. <laughs> so he couldn't ever remember my name. I love that church. But this little lady named Miss Pilgrim, they ran one of the funeral homes there in town. I sat behind all of us young boys every Sunday. It didn't matter where we sat, Miss Pilgrim sat right behind us. And there was no air conditioning in the church. So you remember the old church fans that would fold up? And hers had wood on it. And if we weren't showing the right reverence in church, boy, she'd take that fan and smack us upside the head. And even as we got bigger, I mean, Miss Pilgrim may be the smallest lady I ever met. I mean, Cindy says she's five feet tall. It's a point of contention. <laughs> but Cindy could take Miss Pilgrim to the hoop. <laughs> a point Miss Pilgrim, she would. She would smack us right upside the head. And tell us we better straighten up. And if Miss Pilgrim said she better believe we did. You know why Miss Pilgrim did that? Because she loved us. She was one of the first people other than my family that Cindy met in Hendersonville when I went back. We were on Main Street shopping for an engagement ring, as a matter of fact. And Miss Pilgrim came running up the street and she said, Oh, Spot, I missed you so bad. <laughs> and just hugged me and I hugged her and introduced her to Cindy, and she hugged Cindy, and Cindy hugged her back. But we all knew Miss Pilgrim loved us, even though she was knocking the fire out of us whenever we did that for her. As Christians, we better learn that, we better teach that. If we look at uh, Malachi chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, it says, but for you who fear my name, 
The son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Now, I don't know if any of you leap like a calf that's just gotten free from the stall. That's joy. But it comes first out of fear. If you fear his name, look what else happens. You shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the sole of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Fear of God. It's a good thing. Today, I can tell you the church is losing its young people by the hundreds of thousands. And the age that they typically start falling away is around 16. They have been so bombarded with everything anti-Christian from the time they're very young. That by the time they get to be 16, it's taken effect on an awful lot of them. By the time they get to college, only 40% of them will claim their faith. And these are young people who have been brought up, for the most part, in church-going families. And it's one of the scariest things I have ever seen. If every time, if, if we were in the army, if every time we went into battle, we lost 60% of our troops, we wouldn't be on the field of battle too long, would we? And that's what's happening. They don't know why they, they should stay to this faith. When it's causing them problems in their classes, it's causing them problems socially, is causing them problems every which way they turn. So, one of the primary reasons for this is the lack of the fear of God. I've counseled oh, a numberless number of students through the years. Not just here, but overseas. And they just don't see why. If they're a good person in their eyes, why do they have to keep doing all this religious stuff? Well, that's the problem. They're doing religious stuff and not serving the one and only God. Amen. They don't see that God has a call on their life. That call may be in business. That call may be in a factory. That call may be in a school. That call may be in a church. That call may be in the health services. That call may be in media and in, in entertainment. That call may be in sports. But every one of them has a call. And wherever you go, wherever you spend the majority of your time, that's where your ministry is. Amen. But we cannot do the ministry we were created to do unless we have a fear of God. Hallelujah. Amen. And we have to instill that in our children. It starts when they're very young. You can't wait till they're 16 and go, oh man, I better teach them about the fear of God now. If you have grandchildren, if you have little children, if you're about to have little children, they need to know the fear of God. I told you I admitted our son-in-law, our future son-in-law in first grade. What I didn't tell you was that as soon as we knew Cindy was pregnant, we started praying for that child's spouse. Yes. Amen. Little did I know that God was going to use me to bring him into our life. And now we have a great relationship because I feel like he's mine. 
I mean, I've known him almost as long as I've known Holly. Now, keep in mind, he must have got files. <laughs> but I can tell you from day one in the classrooms that I oversaw, kids were taught the fear of God. We have to understand that if we truly believe that God is God and Jesus is our Lord and Savior, that that has to be taught to the next generation. One of my favorite authors is C.S. Lewis. And he wrote this great book called Mere Christianity. And you have to understand, C.S. Lewis was an atheist. And J.R.R. Tolkien, who... Uh, was a professor with him at Oxford University started witnessing to him and encouraged Lewis to study the Bible. Not just what he was hearing about Christianity but actually study it. And C.S. Lewis became one of the greatest, if not the greatest human apologists for the, for the word of God of anybody in history. He wrote this in 1942 when he wrote Mere Christianity. He said, you must make your choice. Either this man, he's talking about Jesus, was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend it. Think about that statement for just a minute. If we return to that proper fear of God, we will fall at his feet. We will worship him. We'll recognize him for who he is. Because unless you come to God like that, God is going to hear it. So, Jesus is own teaching of eternal punishment has largely been avoided in many churches these days because every time they teach it, they lose somebody. They only want to see Jesus the Lord. And so many pastors are afraid they're going to lose a lot of people. Years ago, I was invited to speak at a church in Louisiana. It was a big church. And so I called the pastor uh, before, I guess it was about 10 days out, 10 days, two weeks. That's when I usually call the pastor, just to discuss what I was going to, what the Lord had laid on my heart to talk about in that, in that church. And so we're talking about the service and the order of service and that sort of thing. And he goes, by the way, he goes, we don't use the Bible in our church. And I thought he was joking. And I laughed. He went, no, 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 I'm serious. I went, wait a minute. I said, I mentioned in the denomination, I said, you're a such and such church, and you're telling me you don't use the word of God in your church anymore? He goes, well, every time I use it, we lose a bunch of people. And I said, well, Pastor, you don't want me in there because I'll clear the place out. <laughs> <laughs> so we mutually agreed that I wouldn't come. But that's the mindset of too many of the churches who build themselves as seeker-friendly. But they're not teaching the Word of God. Let alone the fear of God. So, look at, as I leave this, 
very quickly so that I can I can finish up and get you out on time today. Um, look at Romans 3, verses 10 through 18. If you disagree with the things I'm, I'm talking about, see if you agree with this. He says, there is no one righteous, not even one. That's in verse 10. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. Whew, that's an indictment. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under, is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I think that pretty well describes a lot of what we're seeing in, this, in our own society and world today. Now, I can tell you from having to learn what snakes and are, are dangerous when I go to foreign countries, because the places I go aren't in the tourist brochures. And there are certain snakes, asps, that are so deadly that if they bite you, you're dead. You might as well write it off right there because you'll be dead before they can get you to a hospital and give you the antivirus. And the thing about those apps is they're usually in places that we don't see them. And by the time they come out to strike you, it's too late. Well, that's the way people who don't fear God deceive us with their tongues and poison us with their ideas. So we always have to be on the word. Now we also, very quickly, let me say we also see the fear of God being called. And Oscar, I don't think I gave you this one. But Genesis 3, verses 7 and 10 says, Then the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Then the man and his wife knew the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the breeze of the day, and they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Why? Because they messed up, and they knew it. Nobody had to teach them that. They just knew they were in a heap of trouble. For all they knew, God was going to strike them dead and start all over again. Because they had done the one thing he told them not to do. So they had caught that fear. We see Abraham feared God, as did Jacob and Moses, all without fear being taught to them. They caught it. The Holy Spirit put it in their soul. Even though they didn't even know who the Holy Spirit really was at that time. They were communing with, communing with God himself. They just couldn't look at it. And when we are born, I would argue that the Holy Spirit puts that same fear in us. I know when I'm messing up, whether I want to admit it or not, and I'm sure you do too, there are people who have never read a Bible because they don't have one in their language. Very few anymore. We're getting to the point where everybody's going to have a Bible in their own language. That's not far off. And that should excite you. But they know they should fear a God. They may call him something different than us. But it's amazing how many of them
then believe the same thing that Christians are called to believe without ever having to read it in the Bible. They call it when they were born. Now, they may not do it. Their society may have totally different norms, but they've had to justify that action one way or another. Now, let me move on very quickly to the fear of man, the bad. You know, one of the uh, worst addictions on earth is being burdened by what other people think. You know, people who have criticized me for what I teach or what I preach or, or what I say or what I do, you know, not one of them have ever paid one of my bills. <laughs> Not one of them have come and protected my house against intruders or filled my, my vehicle up with gas, particularly these days. <laughs> but I used to be very burdened by what some of these people thought. And then one day I thought, why? They're not doing anything to me. A lot of times I've never seen them again. Social media makes this even worse because now any troll can come on and tell you how terrible you are and never tell you their name or show their face. I can tell you as a school administrator, if I get an anonymous letter, I don't pay any attention to it. Because the person isn't brave enough to tell me what they think and put their name on it, I ain't got time for it. For all I know, it's just gossip. And by the way, this Bible says that's one of the things that God hates the most. Look in the Bible sometimes at who gossips hang out with. They're not a crowd you want to hang out with. God told us in 2 Timothy 1 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and self control. You know, in the 1930s, the church in Germany was silent in the face of the evil of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. The pastors went along with it, except for just a handful in Germany, who stood up to Hitler. <coughs> but this most monstrous evil that the world has ever experienced was because the German church failed to stand up when it could. Um, you know, I firmly believe that if the Lord has chosen America and the American church to stand against the evils and against uh, the deceptions of the present darkness that we live in, that we better understand our responsible responsibilities and the expectations. And we had better make sure that we're doing everything possible to fulfill that charge from the Lord. Or he's going to vomit us out just like he tells us back in Revelation. You know, today... Uh, we see lots of dictators around the, around the world. I actually had a three-hour dinner one time with Vladimir Putin when I was in Russia. He had just left the KGB where he was in charge of ordering all the assassinations in East Germany. And he was in the process of transferring his career into the political realm. And we were at a, a dinner and I got seated right across from the guy. Now I'll tell you, I have seen a lot of evil in my life. One of the things I did was rescue people from human trafficking. You've never looked at evil until you look into the eyes of someone who is sexually abusing a small child. You can see exactly what that demon looks like. Mm -hmm. 
I worked with a guy named Robert Ressler, who started the behavioral science unit at the FBI, and who coined the phrase serial killers. And Bob would take me around to interview serial killers with him. Those were evil eyes. But I have never seen more evil in a person's eye than I did in Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin could sit there and tell you without blinking that he was a Christian. But his eyes said something else. Let me tell you why. The eyes don't lie. I see evil today. Just like history has taught us about people like uh, Hitler and Stalin and Mao. There is a lot of evil today, a lot of evil uh, that the church needs to stand against, and they're not doing it because they get criticized for standing against the gospel. Now they even have a word for it. The Bible calls it apostasy. Now it's deconstructing the faith. You know what it is? All it is is they're saying, I'm leaving God's standard for man's standard. I don't care what God says. I care what man says. And you can put as pretty a name as you want to on it. It's not deconstructing anything. It's sinning against the one and only God. Amen. And if you are a church leader and you allow that, you are teaching other people to do that. Amen. And I have no patience for it. I have no patience for woke pastors. Right. Right. I don't have much patience anyway, but I really don't have much patience <laughs> with woke pastors. They're called to do one thing, and that's teach biblical truths whether people like it or not. Amen. Did John the Baptist care when he looked at the Pharisees and he said, you brood of vipers, what are you doing here? I love John the Baptist. Yes. <laughs> He's my kind of guy. Except for what he ate. I've eaten my sugar bowls, don't want any more. And why are they doing this? They're threatened because, oh my goodness, people are threatened to cancel them. Christians do it because, oh my goodness, they're going to fire me from my own job. Kids do it because they stand up to something like homosexuality or critical race theory or any of this litany of things that go against God. Because all they are is socialism. Kids do it because they leave, lose their friends. I can't tell you how many high school students I interviewed for admissions in my life, and when I got them away from their parents, and we sat down just to have a five or ten minute conversation, and I asked them, first of all, do you want to go to this school? And second of all, I asked them why. And I can't tell you how many of them in recent years have said, well, I stood up for my faith in school and now I don't have any friends anymore. Well, those are friends that weren't really your friends to begin with. You know, uh, I remember when I was in Denise, I sat down with Cindy and I once upon a time and said, we want to sing this song. <laughs> and we want to know what you think about it. <laughs> And uh, part of the song said, when you're going through hell, don't stop. <laughs> and I said, go ahead and sing it. I was there just last week. <laughs> <laughs> She's still here. I hate it too. That's right. I'll be back a couple of times. <laughs> you know, when Paul finally got the chance to talk to non believers in Acts 17, verses 22 through 32, I got a chance to go through that day. That's a whole nother sermon. He reasoned with them. 
about the unknown God. Because there were gods at every turn. The fear of man is a snare. Because we overestimate the value and benefit of what other people do for us. And what they can do for us. And what they can do to us. Listen, I've had people personally try to kill me in eight countries that I can talk about. And I'm still here. I had a mafia hit contract on my head for a year and a half. I'm still here. John Gotti went to jail and is dead. I'm still here. Why? Because if God is with you, nobody can be against you. And if you're willing to stand with him, he'll stand with you. Now I know the apostles died horrible deaths. But can I tell you something? Jesus was with them when they died. And they felt strongly enough about being with him that they were willing to suffer those deaths. Yeah. Question is, are you? Last thing I'll get to today is the fear of Satan. That's the ugly. You know, we see that Israel returned to uh, God one of the first things they did was they went and removed the high places. The high places were where all the false gods were. The very gods we're bringing back into our society today. Everything from worshiping sex to sacrificing our children. And there's going to be a price to pay for it. Let me tell you an interesting statistic since we're in an election season. So we're being told by one group that if we stand up against abortion, that our the people we support aren't going to be elected. And yet, 73% of the candidates who are strongly against abortion get elected. You see, you got the media, which is controlled by the gods of the high places, which, by the way, we need to take back. Yes. Just like Israel did. And then there's the things they don't want us to know. Did you know that last year, after the ruling, uh, which put the hands of uh, whether or not abortion would be legal back in the hands of the states, that 32,000 additional children were born. Those are 32,000 children, most of whom would have died. Just like the ancient people sacrificed their children to Moloch by throwing them in the fire. 32,000. Let me tell you, at the school that I'm running right now, we have a little girl in kindergarten who's a sweet thing. Her name's Nazareth. And that church that is that started that school puts their actions where the mouth is. And they are very strongly against abortion. And they have stood for it, not just in word, but in deed, and taking care of others who didn't have their babies. Nazareth was the child of a mother that that church witnessed to who didn't have her abortion. And you know, the first chapel I was in with her, kindergarten, she sat down on the Front. She knew what a Pharisee was. She knew what they did. They, she knew why they were wrong. She's the first kindergartner I've ever had to have some India. <laughs> She's amazing and has a beautiful little singing voice. I can only imagine what Nazi's going to do 
one day for for Lord. Because she was saved from the fire. But Satan tries to intimidate us through all these different things. Proverbs 28 1 says, The wicked flee, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. That lion that was outside my window could have cared less what I thought. He was just trying to figure out how to get me out of there. Have you ever seen a cat toy with a mouse? That's what that lion was thinking about. We're, we need to be as bold as lions. 2 Corinthians, excuse me, let me, first of all, John Dawson, in his book, Taking Our City for God, a book I strongly recommend, says we need to lift ourselves out of a self-centered spirituality, a mentality that says we are victims rather than warriors. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. So we've got to be bold as, as lions. One more quote. Tony Evans, one of my favorite pastors, said to be part of the church of Jesus Christ, as Jesus defined it, is to be part of a spiritual legislative body tasked to enact heaven's viewpoint in hell's society. When we start taking God's word out into the world, Satan trembles because you suddenly become very dangerous. Now, I don't know about you, but I agree with missionary C.T. C. T. Stud. Love that last name. How'd you like to be a stud? <laughs> C.T. Stud said, Some wish to live within the sound of the church and chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be among friends today. Lord, I thank you that you sent us a Savior who is not only understanding of the things that we do, but will one day come back as a bold warrior. And those who do not know him, and those who do not fear him, and those who do not recognize him, will feel his wrath while those of us that do get to spend eternity with him. Lord, help us to spread this message. Help us to spread this message in love so that others can see that you are the mighty God, that you are a God to be feared, but a God who, while we fear, we know that you love us. Lord, that's a contradiction I can't think of anybody else praying. So we thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. Lord, I just ask that everybody here would listen to the direction of the Holy Spirit and go where God calls us to go. These things I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's time, folks, that the church stops being the victim and becomes the warrior that God has equipped us and called us to be. Oh, man, powerful word. I just want to say that uh, God is so good. I want to share this before Andy comes. Um, I just wanted to tell you how much he loves you. And he and I both say thank you for the food that you guys sent. I mean, it's such a blessing. 
Um, we're excited. We're glad, first and foremost, the surgery is behind us. He did have prostate cancer, but the report of pathologist is negative. Right? That was contained, and we are now and we are And we are thankful for you. So we love you guys so very, very much. Uh, can I have the ladies come before you come? Sandra, Robin, come here real quick. We had uh, Unashamed yesterday, uh, and we talked about something that we were wanting to do, and I'm going to let these ladies, I'm going to turn the mic over to them real quickly, and they're going to share something with you. <laughs> Come on, I'm going to be one of the first to get access your way to that ministry. Oh. Come on, Robin. First of all, wow. Thank you, <laughs> Terry. Yes. Thank you, Terry. Yes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> all right, Robin and I have took for Nancy to help do the meals for people that may have deaths or sickness, surgery, or whatever. And she's supposed to have something to fill out. Yeah, I do. Um, so if you're interested in helping us, whether it be financially, or you would like to put your name down so when an incident comes up, we can call you and see if you can help us out. Also, um, your phone number would be great. And if you have a special thing you'd like to do, like you know, certain things we'll just feel confident doing. If you write that down, that don't mean it's in stone. You may not be able to make that, but it helps when you start calling and say, well, we ain't gonna get the three people that make spaghetti. We don't wanna overload on the spaghetti. So if you have something or you wanna go pick something up and you don't wanna cook, if you can just give us some ideas, and then you're not, like I said, you don't have to do it that way, but it just helps us orchestrate a little bit better. So, uh, where are you going? What are the first questions? Okay. The only thing, too, with this is I know that, like, Nancy, like, if we kind of open it up more, it gives everybody the opportunity. And then this way we can kind of keep up with it, make sure we're not, you know, everybody's not bringing food on the same day, you know, and kind of it helps the person that's getting it because, you know, you get so much food and say it's just one or two people, you know. So we kind of keep it and help it help the person out. Um, right now, um, you know, Diane um, is out, and we kind of need to set up something for her. I think today we kind of have it covered, but if you can kind of come see us if you're interested after, you know, the service, um, I have a piece of paper, the dates and stuff, um, like if you're with Otis. Yeah, and if you want, if you can't do anything, like, you know, a lot of us work, we, you know, either you can pick up something or you can give us money, you know, where one of us can go pick it up. Um, either way would be great. Um, but just kind of see us after. And I think maybe we can see, like if it's a house of just two, mm -hmm. you know, maybe every other day it could be. Because you can overwhelm people with food. Um, they can, if they can eat it two days and then go back. So we'll just have to figure all that out. Nancy, you got something you want to say? Yeah, uh, it'd be really important to ask them if they're a diabetic in the family. Yeah, so they need to know what, yeah. what they can eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like things they don't Yeah, because we should them. reach out to them and ask them kind of all that. Yeah. Um, and some people might say, oh, we don't need food every day. Like, yeah. that kind of stuff. And also, Edward is also down because he fell if he didn't know. So they're kind of really in a position in their home right now. And then she does have a son that lives at a grandson right now. So there's three people in their home. Is that right, Nancy? Yes, Okay. And I think that's it. If we think of something, we'll come back with that. But do you know of like stuff that, that Diane doesn't like or maybe they can't have or? Diane does not like humans. <laughs> well, when we all get together, we'll kind of talk about it. She didn't like cleaning up. Now, the grandson loves cleaning up. That's one thing I was going to take. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That is awesome. Carrie, that was out. Yeah. That was, that was, I was sitting back here doing my job 
and I found a belly laugh because I was telling him, hearing him tell about the lion. I went from laughing happy. Yeah. <laughs> my mind goes other places. I'm thinking, if this is me, the lion's going to get in. Yeah. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. But one thing you're not going to worry about is chasing that lion down. Because when they come to find me, they're going to find that lion in a meat coma. <laughs> and that lion's going to be like, y'all might as well just shoot me because I ain't running nowhere. <laughs> if you like me eating a bunch of chicken on Sunday, I'm just going to go out there with a meat stretch and not be able to do nothing. But, uh, you know, you talk about armies, and you think of God armies, God's armies, and you think of thousands of Christians running in the Bible, I think they're. Um... What a blessing that was today. Yes. That was something that needed to be heard and it's out there on the interweb now. And I pray to God so many people. It was hit YouTube the next I, I, I just it's gonna light people up. I pray God sends those who need to hear to it. Yes. To hear. A couple things just real quick. Um we don't have to mark off on a shame now. That just happened. Um, church app again. If you, if you don't have a church app, get with me. Uh, I can download it for you. I can help you out with it. It's a piece of cake. Don't take no time at all. Keeps you updated on what's going on with the church, and we'll be sending out information. Of course, when I say we, I mean us. Um, support the church. Uh, you can go to infusion, uh, infusionchurchnc.com, uh, or you can click and click giving, or you can text. 336-777-7674 or you can mail it to us or you can come see my very happy, pretty, smiley face every week and give to the church. Um, we'd love to see you. Um, but uh, give when you can. Um, of course, uh, Kids Church, second, fourth Monday of each Sunday. Uh, I say what I say. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about work tomorrow. I'm already um, So, the special offering, again, I'm not going to beat this thing to death. We got to have it. That's the bottom line. But we also told you guys we are not going dead again ever. Ever. Credit card is dead. So, we're trying to raise this money. We need the um, we need $2,000 uh, by March 3rd. Um, for everybody, give what you can. This is above and beyond past. Um, so, for everybody, uh, whatever God puts on your heart to give, um, give. Uh, if you want to give it now, you can. Uh, that's up to y'all, but we're saying on March 3rd, we're going to take the final offering, and whatever we get, that's what we're going to run on. We pray that they, uh, Lord, give us what we need. We need the copyright license. We don't want to make nobody mad. I'm sensitive. I'm going to tell you that. If you don't need my copyright licenses, I'm going to cry. But, you know what? Um, sometimes you don't know you need to hear things till you hear it. And I didn't know I needed to hear what I needed to hear this morning from Brother Terry Brock. I'll tell you something. Man. I'm um, that, that, is just, that is just fantastic. I pray you guys have a great week. Uh, so glad to hear about uh, Otis doing well. I know he's doing well. I don't know if people know, if people know about it or not, but uh, I know that um, Ed did fall off the ladder. Most of you know that. He was beat up pretty bad. Uh, but he's, from what I'm hearing, he's doing very well. Uh, so hope to see him back soon. And we're going to continue to pray for him, continue to pray for Otis, uh, pray for my. Uh, Brother in law, he's going in the morning to have some major surgery. Uh, pray that things go well with PJ. And uh, Diane had surgery Friday. God's will be done. And Diane did have surgery on Friday. She's, she's doing good. That's, that's fantastic. So keep these prayers on your hearts. Keep them close to your hearts. And that's it, man. I, 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 don't, I pray you guys have a fantastic week. Amen. And look at the person next to you and say, Look, I don't know if he's full of today. <laughs> well, that's San Francisco or Kansas City. But if you tell me who you're pulling for, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> if you tell me who you're pulling for, and thank you for lunch, and I'll tell you why you're wrong. Y'all have a great day. We'll see you next week.